So I guess it's time to begin, huh? I, uh, the topic today is forgiveness and repairing relationships. And uh, I was very worried I'd ask your forgiveness for being late. I uh, found it took a little more time to get here than I realized from the medical center. So I came over here from Stanford Hospital. And uh, so I have a little handout to begin here with. And uh, first of all, by wishing you all a happy Valentine's Day. So we even put this uh, in sort of a Valentine pink here. <laughs> so keeping the mood of the season. And um, the interesting thing is how much um, forgiveness is related to Valentine's Day. Because um, I don't think without forgiveness we'd have a very good Valentine's Day. They uh, sort of belong together. And uh, like this first, uh, this first uh, quotation here, I'll just leave some extras here. This first quotation, any marriage is a union of two sinners. And we know we're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. And uh, a happy marriage is a union of two forgivers. And uh, I think that is a very good way of putting it because, um, you know, we go through the year and things come up and we're imperfect. We uh, maybe uh, left the lights on all night, uh, didn't uh, turn off the uh, heater in the bathroom or uh, all kinds of things. We were late for dinner when we said we'd be there at 6 o'clock. We got there at 6.30. I may have that problem tonight. So anyway, these things happen all the time, or at least just the little things. So forgiveness is very much a part of a, a happy marriage. If there isn't a lot of forgiveness there, uh, there's not much glue. And uh, it's kind of like looking at a bouquet of flowers. You know, you could have the flowers there, and there's the love. But when you have the arrangement, you know, when you buy a um, dozen roses, for example, you can hand a dozen roses, or you can have baby tears. For years and years, baby tears and roses. Let's see if I can remember the name now. <laughs> um, not philodendron, but uh, what is the word for baby tears? I forgot it now. Huh? That's right, yes. Gypsophilium, isn't it? Is that? <laughs> anyway, and, and it's like they just make the whole thing come together. You know, they give life to it. Or it's like flowers and leaves. Uh, you can have leaves on a tree or leaves on a plant. They too belong together. I mean, without the leaves, the flowers wouldn't bloom. Even with the magnolias who are blooming right now without any leaves, that particular kind of magnolia it looks lovely now and with the leaves there. But it depends on the leaves to bring in the, uh, the chlorophyll and the water down to the plant and down to the roots. So they kind of work together. And um, they kind of uh, make it possible for the flowers to grow. So that's the way it is, I think, with forgiveness. Hi, Gloria. Forgiveness and uh, love. They just are kind of... Uh, very, very much interchangeable, very much belong to one another. Now, so what is forgiveness? That's what we want to talk about and think about today. And uh, so, like most people, we begin with by looking at a dictionary. And the Oxford Dictionary gives kind of a formal definition. Forgiveness is to grant free pardon and to give up all claim on account of an offense or debt. Something happened to us that we did not like, that we did not appreciate, or we did not get something that we had hoped for, and that's denied to us. We don't like that. So these are the kind of the two situations in which forgiveness becomes a very much a part of our life and how we um, deal with day-to-day um, -day relations. So... Um, when we think of forgiveness... You can think very much in terms of the, that kind of a formal definition. Now, Fred Luskin, and I suspect some of you must be familiar with Fred, 
He's a very, very well-known Stanford guy. He's been at the university for some time working on his PhD. And then he published this little book, Forgive for Good, which is really a marvelous book. I mean, it goes much further into this than we have time for today. But Fred involves using um, meditation kinds of exercises and ways of relaxing and thinking through what is it that you're really upset about, that you have a grievance about, that needs to deal with the issue of forgiveness. And we all have these. This is a part of life. In fact, um, as Fred puts it, forgiveness is peace and understanding in the present moment. And that's kind of a very down-to-earth sort of basic definition. But also, this is a time in which, um, you know, in some ways, Valentine's Day is something like the holidays that we have. There are times that we celebrate, and it's wonderful, and we give cards, and we receive cards, and we feel very good. But for many people, it's not a happy time. Maybe in the last year, they've lost a spouse. <coughs> Maybe something else has happened, or had a bad accident, or they had a bad illness, or something like this. And so sometimes these days that should be very uplifting and cause us to celebrate and give us a great deal of joy, sort of intensify the discomfort we're feeling or the unhappiness because we don't have our mate with us this year and we did last year or something of that nature. So it, it kind of goes both ways. It's a happy time, but it's a time in which it brings up feelings of, of gee, I wish, you know, they were last year. So that's also a part of whenever we're together in a holiday and when forgiveness comes in, how we forgive one another and enjoy life together. So I want to talk about a little bit about forgiveness is sort of rooted in life itself. I mean, let's just kind of think about it for a moment. When we were kids, um, we learned about forgiveness pretty much right away. Our parents told us, uh, you know, you, you messed up the, uh, your blanket, or you lost your toy, or you hit your sister. Say, now you should apologize to your sister, or you should apologize to your brother. We're constantly, from almost the day we begin talking, dealing with the issue of, gee, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I forgive you. So forgiveness is kind of, we just start out almost from as soon as we can start talking. And then we get into school, and Mary push Johnny, and so the teacher says, okay, now Mary, you have to push to Johnny. Bill pushes Linda down the, down the slide. Bill, you, you've got to apologize to Linda, and so on. You have to be sorry. You have to forgive. So it's very much something that almost when we begin relating to one another, we're dealing with the issue of forgiveness. We deal with it in our families. We deal with it when we go to school when we are in clubs, when we do things and play games with one another. It's just a very much a part of life. And the interesting thing is that, um, well, maybe this is uh, what Mr. Rogers had in mind when he said, uh, remember Mr. Rogers, the very popular guy on television, who said, I love you just the way you are. You know, you may have chocolate all over your face. You may have... Uh, pulled the dog's tail, you may have done something else, but you know, I love you just the way you are. So the, a kind of forgiveness that I think made him very endearing to children, because they felt, gee, you know, this is really nice just to be forgiven. And there are kinds of family rituals around forgiveness that we um, find ourselves learning uh, when we're very young. Uh, for example, I heard recently the Rockefeller children and you know here you have um, not Nelson Rockefeller but the <laughs> Rockefeller who was one of the robber barons um, who uh, you know was a very kind of rough guy yet at home the children were taught before when they went to bed to um, turn to this to turn to their brother or sister and say do you forgive me for all I have done to you today Every night, that's what the Rockefeller children did. They turned to one another and said to their sibling, do you forgive me for all I have done to you today? Now, 
For some of you, this may um, recall the kind of the bedtime Shema, which is, of course, a series of bedtime prayers. And when it's said something to the effect, I forgive anybody who hurt or angered me today. I forget anyone who hurt or angered me today. Again, a way in which forgiveness is kind of built in to our lifestyle from the time we're children, going to bed, growing up, and relating to one another. But the question is, why is it we do not forgive when it's so built into life and we have problems? And I think some of the reasons is the desire is there and the intention is there but there is a more primitive instinct we all have, which kind of we see in animals, and that's the old fight or flight kind of reaction to a stressful situation or a threatening situation. Every animal has sort of an invisible line of boundary that kind of determines for them what is safe and what is not safe. So if you get within so much feet, if you're some distance from the animal, okay, they're kind of, it's safe, so they don't flight, they stay there. But if you cross that invisible line, then it's either fight or flight. It's a mother bear guarding her children, you can be sure that's going to be fight. If it's a deer who's nervous and so on, it'll be flight. And that's kind of a primitive instinct we have. And I think that's what makes it difficult sometimes for us to deal with forgiveness. We're wondering, do we fight or do we flight? But n forgiveness is somewhere in between. It's we negotiate. We try to make the best out of this situation. And that's why it's peculiarly human. I don't know if animals forgive one another or not, but I do know that it's very much an essential <coughs> part of our lives as human beings as we relate to one another. By the way, feel free to make comments or ask questions as we kind of go along through here. The interesting thing is um, as we live in community and negotiate, we also are deeply rooted, many of us, through a historic, it's, it's so much a part of religion and faith, forgiveness. And I've just kind of have listed here a few, um, <coughs> some I'm sure are quite familiar to you. But within the Jewish tradition, for example, what scripture is more graphic or engaging around the whole topic of forgiveness? I mean, there are many in the Jewish scriptures, of course, but in the prophet Hosea, has, which has always been one of my favorites, in the 11th chapter, there's those marvelous words when God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to Baals. They kept offering incense to idols. So here they are. They're not responding to God. They're doing things that God does not want them to do. They should be asking forgiveness, but rather it's God who extends forgiveness, who says, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks and bend down to them and fed them. And that incredible, beautiful picture of forgiveness the parent leaning down to the child, no matter how bad the child has been, unfaithful, unruly, or whatever, caring for him, accepting him, lifting him up as a child and loving him. This is what God is. This is the essential thing, the loving parent. He said, they shall re and then he promises, they shall return to the land of Egypt and Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes an oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket with the people of Israel. The people are bent on turning away from me to the most high they call, 
but he does not answer them at all. But then God says, but how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebulim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. I mean, a tremendous message of forgiveness. And that's kind of the model that that passage gives to us as how we should be interacting with one another. Of course, there's also very, very special and sacred time within the Jewish tradition of Yom Kippur. And of course, as you all know, this is when forgiveness is sought. Forgiveness for the wrongs we have committed during the prior year. During Yom Kippur, it's a time for fasting and praying for God's forgiveness for the transgressions we've made against God during the year. Again, this basic message of forgiveness and seeking God's forgiveness. But it's also tied in that God can only forgive one of the sins who is committed against God. It's also necessary for to give those people that we have wronged. So forgiveness and asking for God's forgiveness is very much linked to the people we live with and how forgiving have we been. So within the Jew Jewish tradition, you have this very strong emphasis upon forgiveness. Within the Christian tradition, again, it's interesting, one of the most uh, precious, most special, I think, stories of forgiveness for most Christians would be the story of the prodigal son, which kind of parallels the story that we read from Hosea. Hosea. Again, it's a situation where you have a father with a son and said, hey, dad, you know, you're in pretty good shape financially. Uh, you've got your, my brother here, the older brother, to take care of the farm and so forth. So why don't you give me my share and I'll go to the city and kind of do an IPO or something and be very successful. But of course he does and he's not successful. He ends up s squandering all the money and making a fool of himself and finds himself begging pretty much like a homeless person on the street. Then he says, this is nuts. You know, at least my servants in my dad's place are living better than this. So I'm gonna go home and see if I can at least get a job for my dad. So he goes home. On his way home, his dad sees him from a great distance, says, bring out the best coat, bring out the rings, and runs and greets him and puts a, a um, robe on his shoulders and gives him acceptance of love and says, my son. So he is still his son. He is forgiven. This is kind of the model that's given in the Christian tradition of forgiveness. Again, very much like that of Hosea. Or if you look at Islam, they have four steps, which are part of the forgiveness process. Three have to do with um, uh, things that have been done against God. Recognize the offense before those against whom offense was committed and before God. Committing oneself not to repeat the offense. And if it's been with someone that's a neighbor or someone that you interact with or a family member, do whatever needs to be done to rectify the offense within reason and asking pardon of the offended party and then ask God for forgiveness. So again, you have the, in the Islamic tradition, the emphasis upon forgiveness. The Hindu tradition, and just running through these for by way of example, forgiveness is a virtue of the weak and an ornament of the strong. Forgiveness subdues all in this world. What is there that forgiveness cannot achieve? In the Buddhist tradition from one of the Dalai Lamas, all major religious traditions carry basically the same message. That is love, compassion, and forgiveness. The important thing is they should be part of our daily lives. 
or to just put it in terms of what Alexander Pope said when he reflected on the role of forgiveness in our life, a very famous saying, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, good nature and good sense must ever join. To err is human, to forgive is divine. Now, one of our, so it really is really a part of, intrinsic part of so many of our major faiths, of all of our major faiths. Sometimes you um, might use this as an opportunity for a joke, which Garrison Keillor does, who is the um, guy on the radio who is often um, has ways of tweaking religion. And he <laughs> said, since true forgiveness is such a divine quality, we don't have to practice it. Which, uh, <laughs> of getting out of the whole thing. But uh, we're not going to go there. We're going to still look at what forgiveness is all about. And what does it mean to be a forgiving person? Religion, in a sense, emphasizes the essential goodness of life and what it is that God wants from us, that through forgiveness, we participate in the goodness of life as God would have it be for us. Now, forgiveness, of course, as I said in the beginning, has to do with those kinds of situations where something happened to us that we did not want, that we did not ask for, that we do not appreciate, and it was hurtful. It made us upset. It disturbed us. It's something that happened to us, or it is something that we were hoping would happen, that we were going to get a better job, that we're going to get a bigger house, or that we're going to have uh, a better uh, profession, whatever, but it didn't, we didn't get it. It didn't happen to us. And so we feel that we, have, we didn't get the raise that we thought we were going to get, or the promotion that it looked like that we deserved. And so then how do we forgive that supervisor? How do we live with that? How do we... Um, come to terms with it. Well, you could say um, that, you know, things that affect us in a negative way that hurt us are basically on a long continuum. You know, here on, on one end of the continuum, we're kind of, okay, I was late for dinner. I'm sorry. I forgive you. Um, okay, I didn't mail the letter when I said I would, and I didn't mail the income tax when I said I would, and da -da, okay, I forgive you. So these are, and it kind of goes up the continuum to um, you forgot my birthday, or you forgot our anniversary, or you forgot something else that was important to both of us to make the plane reservations, the theater reservations. So that becomes a little more up the ladder. And then it goes up to gossip. You've said bad things about me. Or then the next one, lies. You lied about me. You said that I did da-da-da and I didn't. Or it might go up to, why was it that you loved my brother more than you loved me and the family? Why is it that I was always the one who was blamed for everything? So here's another area that goes up in terms of severity. The unloved child. Divorce, which is certainly a painful I've never, people talk a little bit about we had a very um, amiable, amicable divorce, but I've never met very many. I think for most people that I'm aware of, and my wife happens to be a divorce attorney, so um, I have some experience from that indirect source, but uh, divorce is a very painful time. It's a sense of the failure of a dream, feelings of fault, and so on. And so then, that's a very difficult time. Then a continuum of forgiveness, if you go up further, maybe you've been a victim of a crime. And how do you, why should I forgive this person who committed this crime against me, who burglarized my home, who held me at gunpoint, or some of this, and then to abuse and then murder. In other words, forgiveness may be not such a major thing here, but it can go very, very up here to a very, very major thing. Now, the interesting thing is when, and some of you probably know this, when um, 
Fred Luskin did his work in forgiveness and still doing it. Uh, one of the most interesting things he did was he tried to say, now what would be the most horrible kind of thing to try to forgive? I mean, it just kind of really defies almost imagination how you go about it. And what he and a minister here in Palo Alto did was they got some of the families from Northern Ireland when they were having the tremendous battles and all the bombings and murdering and fighting and so on. And so he, he got the parents whose children he got whose children were killed in the violence of Northern Ireland. And he got them from the Protestant group and he got them from the um, Catholic group to see if they could somehow be able to bring themselves to forgive for what this pain and distress that they had suffered. And he, he really made some, it was just incredible. <coughs> I mean, they didn't just say, oh, you know, this is wonderful, so no problem. They were able to experience some degree of forgiveness. They were able to express it. They were able to kind of move on with their life. And, and that's kind of one of the critical issues here is that when we get caught in this forgiveness kind of situation, it can just kind of drag us down. And we kind of, life passes us by and we're sort of feeling stuck. Um, so what's important is to recognize that when we are unable to forgive, it does affect our health. It affects our cardiovascular, affects our um, digestive, it affects our sleeping, it affects us mentally, we're depressed, we uh, have difficulty sleeping, and all these kinds of things. And yet one of the important resources that we have when we are dealing with depression and trying to deal with the issue of how do we forgive and how do we prov extend forgiveness to someone who has hurt us or distressed us. How do we go about doing that? One of the most important ingredients we have is social friendship. Two or three people that we can talk to these could be tremendous resources for us. If these are people that we respect, that we know that they care for us, that we have that closeness of relationship, they could be a tremendous source of support and help us to get some clarity and try to understand what's happened. There's some interesting studies about how important social support is to our health and well-being, whether it's physical, mental, or whatever it is. The people that have a good social support network usually have better health, they live longer, they're less prone to mental health problems, suicide, less prone to alcohol, and so that social support system has a tremendous safety net for our health and why it's so important to have that sort of resource in our life. There's an interesting study that was done on um, people who were admitted to retirement communities. <coughs> and what they found out that the first six months is the critical point of transition, which I suspect many of you are very familiar with. But the one thing, the one component that seemed to make the difference more than anything else was having a social support system. And the people that were able to connect and make social connections within that retirement community did much better in terms of living longer, being happier, being healthier, and so on. It was just as a result of that kind of being able to make those social connections. Now, in terms of asking for forgiveness, there is a caveat here, and that is when you get locked into your situation where you feel like you've been so offended 
that you can't forgive. And then you get into the sort of self-pity mode and start your own self-pity club. And then so that when you get together with your social network or two or three friends that you're close to, and you're repeating the same story and the same complaints, that's not going to work. That's going to wear out, and it's not going to go very far. So there is kind of, while the social connections and a network are very essential, abusing them is going to sort of take the wind out of the sails, and they're not going to be that, that kind of support. So that's an important thing to remember. So that kind of gets us right, and I, what I'm really kind of trying to circle down to uh, is that how, how does this really work out in terms of asking forgiveness? And, and what is it that we're asking forgiveness for? Uh, Fred Luskin, when he talks about the process of forgiveness, he says there are three critical steps that happen. The first step is that we feel tremendously offended, that we have been wronged, that we have been hurt. And this is very painful, that my wife betrayed me, my husband lied to me, my parents left everything obviously cared more to my sister than they did for me. It's, it's something really has happened that feels very painful, that feels like I've been poorly used, I've been hurt, and I've been treated badly. The second step after feeling this sense of hurt and being treated poorly is then attributing the blame to that whatever initiated that. And that becomes the reason why I'm depressed. That becomes the reason why I can't get on with my life. This other person is to blame. A few years ago, well, it's more than a few years ago, I guess about 40 years ago now, there used to be a very famous psychiatrist here in the Bay Area, um, Eric, um, uh, anyway, he wrote the book, Games People Play, and that may be familiar to some of you. Eric Byrne, all right, thank you. And Eric Byrne, one of the games that he identified was the game, If It Were Not For You. And the people play this game, if it were not for you, I could have been president. If it were not for you, you know, I could have been in the Olympics. If it were not for you, and so on. And so it becomes an excuse for not making it. And so the, wh the second step in the process of forgiveness, then there is an offender who is at fault, who is to blame. This is, the per this is what you did, you are to blame, and that's why I am not succeeding. So I've been hurt, it's your fault. And then the creation of a, a grievance lament. A tremendous grievance has been created. So this is a third step. A story comes out of it. This is the story that the person repeats and repeats to whoever will listen to it. You know, and the good intentioned friends will listen to it and agree first time, second time, maybe the third time, but then, hey, wait a minute, this is kind of like a broken record. But the person is locked into that story of grief and the grievance that's been committed against them. And this becomes the um, most significant part of his life. So the goal is how do we somehow release this past to heal our present and to enrich our future? How do we somehow move beyond this? Well, some of the things we have to do, and I think would be helpful, first, we have to avoid the trap of unenforceable rules. You know, if you had not been alcoholic, then our marriage would have been okay. But 
you cannot enforce that rule that this partner has to be non-alcoholic. In every relationship, there are some un you have to recognize there are some un unenforceable rules. If that person is going to be unfaithful, you can't say you can't be unfaithful. You can say it, but it's not unenforceable rule. That person is going to do it. There's no way you can enforce that. I mean, you can hire detectives or anything else, but you can't really enforce that person. That person, the only person that can change is that person. So we have to be very careful in what are we trying to do and what are we asking for when we have this pain that has been a part of our life and has been extended to us, that we make it into a grievance that we continually repeat and repeat. And the problem, there are several problems with this. Probably one of the most important problems is it takes over our life. The grief story takes over our life. We can't concentrate on our work. We can't concentrate on our studies. We can't concentrate on our hobbies, on our family, because of this grief story. Fred Luskin talks about, you know, we have, we can think of our life as like a, a big room. We have all of these things in the room, so much, just but so much room. I like to think of it as kind of the command center uh, of our life, our mental and emotional command center. There's only so much space. Now, if, these if this grief story and this unresolved grief takes up all the space, so that's the only thing you can do, talk about it, think about it, dream about it, lie awake nights not being able to sleep about it, that's taking up a lot of space that could be going to other things. It could be going to, how am I going to move on from here? What would I really like to do? From creating a kind of story that would make the life, the, your life, a happier ending, that would make you a happier person. What could I do to achieve that? Well, if you have all of this grief taking up the physical command center, it, it, you don't have time, to, you just don't have enough left over to try to get beyond it because it's taken over your life. It's taken over the command center. And what you somehow need to do is get beyond that. That's what we need to do. And we get uh, in a kind of a grief situation like this. And um, so far, is there any questions at this point? Because <laughs> this, this whole thing of one unenforceable rules is very basic to recognize we can't ask for something that we can't change. If we, what we have to do is accept that this is an unenforceable rule. I cannot change this person. That person has to change himself or herself. And then the second, the value, yeah. Um, it seems to me that in some cases there's a, a, a dual, um, there's a dynamic between the two people. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking, uh, maybe, let's say you're looking back at a situation, and then you start to think, well, if I had done X, Y, or Z, maybe there would have been some change in that person. There would have been some change. Some change in that other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, the situation was such that you, you still feel offended and wronged, and it's very difficult to get beyond that. Because you tried that. So, and it I mean, you're talking about an unenforceable rule. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there was something that could have been enforced. Not enfor enforced is not a good word, but. Um, there is something that could be done, but the other person has to do it. You. What I could have done. If you had, well, that's part of that grief process too. If only I had done this. If only I had done that. Then, and possibly. But in all probability, the other person 
didn't ac accept it in a way that was going to lead to any change. And they're going to continue. They may say, you know, and as we all know, um, alcoholics, for example, will say, I'm going to change. I'll never have another drink. And uh, they'll say these things. But of course, you're acting on the basis of the behavior. And so what they say is one thing, but what they do is the more important thing. And so you have to react to the behavior and say that's, and recognizing that the only person that can change that behavior is the other person. And uh, how then do we move to the whole area of forgiveness in dealing with that person and in our relationship and having the relationship continue? Um, so yeah. In response to her comment, because I kind of identified with what she was saying, because mm -hmm. I've been in that situation where it says, what could I have done? And one of the things that I went through in forgiveness is to forgive myself. Yeah. You know, you have the other person to forgive, but also you have to forgive yourself for whatever, you know, brought you to that hurtful situation. Mm-hmm. Does that? That's a very good point. And I think also you shouldn't underestimate the things that you did do. Yeah, but you, you should also give yourself credit to say, you know, I tried this and I tried this and I tried this. So it wasn't just being a passive victim and blaming. And so I think forgiving yourself is very much a part of it, but also being good to yourself and recognizing that probably you gained some strengths in doing that that you were able to reach out even though it was not reciprocated. And that's going to serve well in other relationships. But it is true, I think, the importance of forgiving ourselves because then you've moved beyond kind of the blame game of saying, well, it's all your fault and you, if you hadn't done that, then everything would have been wonderful. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to ask one thing. If you recognize that somebody is reliving something over and over like they were laid off from a job. Yeah. And that's all I call them Johnny One Note, you know. Yes. Uh should you recognize that to them? That this is uh time to move on? Um or should you actually make suggestions or let it pass, ignore it, let somebody else do it? Well, I think you have to do what you're more com most comfortable with. Um, what I would be more inclined to do would be to say, you know, this story, you're obviously in a great deal of pain. This has been very painful for you. But I'm wondering, if you're aware of the fact that by being so stuck in this story, it's also preventing you from moving beyond it. Have you thought maybe of ways of how you might move beyond the story? Just imagine how you might. What mightn't you do? Uh, maybe you'd go out and get a job. Maybe you would go to night school and get a better career. Or just kind of. But I think encouraging people but what, what we don't realize is that when we, get, when we get caught in this grievance kind of cycle is in point of fact, when something like that happens, there are actually many, many ways that they could have responded to this painful thing. Instead of let, dragging down their whole life and getting stuck in it so it becomes their grievance story for or, or ours. I mean, we've all had kind of experiences like this, we forget that there were an infinite an other number of ways we could have reacted. But we've kind of shut them out because there was so much hurt and pain here. But just to kind of get a friend to say, gee, what if, what are some of the other things you might have done? Or what other things? Even to begin to loosen up 
the fact that you don't have to be stuck <coughs> in this grievance story. So that's, I mean, yeah, I mean. Um, is there another way you could phrase allocate space to your mental emotional command center? I, I, I just phrase what? Another way to, another verb maybe for allocate <coughs> space to your mental emotional command center. What's the difference between that and um, just um, put that aside and give your life time, give the time in your life to some other pursuit? Well, that, that's what the ideal is. Uh, it is kind of a spatial image, but maybe if you think of it as a spatial image, and I have to be a visual thinker, so it <laughs> makes it a little easier for me. Um, you know, another thing that could go in there would be uh, a camping trip instead of perseverating on this pain and what happened to me in this relationship. Or think of it in terms of, if you think of life as a uh, camping trip, where you, you know, I just came back from a conference in D.C., we'll say, so we think of that as my life, going from San Francisco to D.C. or something. You pack your suitcase for that life trip, but there's only room for so much stuff. Now, if I put it all in terms of shoes or something, what am I doing? But it, so if you put it all in terms of this grievance, that sort of squeezes out the other space. Well, what about um, going to concerts? What if I started going camping? What if I started joining this club? What if I started giving time to the local uh, food shelter, uh, shelter or food program? whatever, and, and begin to think of some other options. What happens is you get locked oftentimes in that grief story and that it kind of closes you down. And so that's, that's why I kind of like that uh, spatial sort of metaphor. It makes it easier. Yeah. It's very interesting when you bring up the word forgiveness, it involves two people generally. Successful. One, one is in the position that does the forgiving. Yeah. So there's a, there's a give and take here because in order for you to forgive, you have to rise to a certain quality of life internally because on the other hand, you would have to be forgiven something that you have done. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to do forgiveness is to look in self, how you rise up to the position because if something is not available to solve the situation, how do you solve it? But it, it means you have to solve yourself before you can solve somebody else. It works back and forth either way, so there's no real solution except if you rise to the position of looking at things or growing in self to a goodwill standard. In order for you it's almost like saying, how does a person walk in a humility, in a self mm -hmm. level of standard, that he doesn't look at everything, or she doesn't look at everything, as so bad. Yeah, and that's what I think the opening quotation was about, in terms of, um, you know, any marriage is a union of two sinners, a happy marriage is a union of two forgivers. Both. Both have to forgive and say, you know, I'm really sorry that um, I didn't wake you up in time for the appointment you had to me. And okay, that's okay, I forgive you. What we're talking about is situations where you feel like you've been hurt and you say, I'm hurt, but the other person doesn't say, I'm sorry or forgive. And um, you feel like you've been poorly used. <clears throat> and so it's very hard to forgive that person because they may have done something really dreadful. Um, so you have um, the husband that has the affair with a next door neighbor, uh, you know, was whether or not he says he's sorry and whether or not the wife forgives him, that has to be, a, 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 but oftentimes what happens is one party 
says I'm sorry, but then they go on and do it again. And then you have kind of an unenforceable rule. So we're trying to talk about those kinds of situations where you feel like you were abused or hurt and the other person didn't really want to admit that they had done this or else they want to end the relationship or they want to keep doing what they've been doing. And what, but I think whether, yeah, when there's a mutuality, we, we both forgive and then that's what it's all about. But I, what I'm trying to talk about is, and what Luskin, I think, talks about too, and his forgiveness for good, is those kind of situations where it's all kind of up to you. The other person isn't going to move much. <coughs> so part of it is dealing with a situation that makes you angry. So getting angry with someone is sometimes appropriate. Anger usually doesn't help very much, but it may help just kind of blow the steam off, but then you have to move on beyond that. But um, anger can be obviously a part of it, but it can also keep you from healing and going on if all you do is get stewed, stay in your anger, and then it begins to take even more uh, health problems, make more health problems for you. Um, so, um, well, I thought we'd do at this point. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Didn't Mr. Luskin lose the daughter in a car accident? Beg pardon? Didn't he lose the daughter in a car accident? What about a car accident? Didn't Fred Luskin lose the daughter in a car accident? Fred? I don't know. I haven't talked to Fred recently. I was wondering whether he forgave that driver. I think so. Does anyone know that? But that would be. This is like a horrendous. Yeah. Um, That's act. exactly. Well, they, huh. I hadn't heard that, but I, I haven't been in contact with Fred lately. It's funny because I was just thinking of giving him a call and getting together for lunch or something. So. Yeah. It's interesting how those. Yeah. They happen. Yeah. It would, I'm sure Fred would, s and I'm, I can see Fred saying there was a real, a really difficult challenge for him. Hmm? Oh, that's next. <laughs> Dear Carolyn, approximately 10 years ago, my wife had an affair with our daughter's soccer coach. Of the nearly seven billion people on the planet, she was adamant that she had found her, quote, soulmate, unquote. Not only has she never apologized for the affair, but I had to beg her not to leave, primarily to keep our two kids close to their friends and extended family as we could not afford our neighborhood in a divorce and would have had to move away. Both kids eventually graduated from great colleges and grew up never knowing of their mother's affair. We both sought counseling, but oddly enough, the starting point was always having the blame leveled at me. After all, if I were the perfect husband, my wife would never have cheated. I still harbor anger and disappointment in my marriage, despite the fact that we both get along. While we have sex, I would no longer consider it making love. I would like for someone in my shoes to tell me whether the hurt goes away and what is the nature of forgiveness. It seems people who have never been in my shoes are quick to dispense the forgive and forget, get on with your life advice. So what strikes you about the story, just in terms of what some of the things that we've been talking about. A lot, lot of blame. She's the one who did the whole thing. He has a grievance story that he's worked together, and he's he's nurtured this story for ten years. I mean, it's like it could have happened last week instead of ten years ago. This is how much pain there is for this guy, and how alive it is for him. And that's what oftentimes happens when we don't forgive. We can f 
find ourselves hanging on to these things, like a dog with a bone just hanging on and kind of that becomes in a way our life. Um, and the other thing that thoughts or reflections or about it. Feel or understand his feeling of not being able to let go. I mean, that's the whole, that's the crux of it. How? You know, how do you get there? And, um, so, 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 so this guy has one unenforceable rule, and that is that his wife should apologize and promise never to do it again. Something like that. But there's no way he can enforce that rule. He did try counseling, and she said, well, if you were perfect, then I would be perfect. And if I were he, I would have said, oh, if I had a perfect wife, then I'd be the perfect husband. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, they're each blaming each other. Yeah. 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 But it's just. <coughs> yeah. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a good way of describing it. And there's a sadness about it. Uh, you've been nurturing this for 10 years. The other thing, <coughs> one of the several things about this letter kind of intrigued me, but the other thing is how can he recognize how in spite of this pain and anger, how much he's accomplished? I mean, okay, they've kept the house, that's, that's nice. But the kids did not turn out to be drug addicts. The daughter didn't get pregnant at 15 or something like that and run away and get married. I mean, the kids both did well. How much can he give himself credit for what he's achieved? But it's like that just doesn't, it doesn't seem to go on his radar screen. It's all so perseverated and focused on this one thing that happened, which may have been a one night stand, may not be not that important actually. But to forgive her and to move on with his life. Well, why is it so hard for people to do that? My sister <coughs> reminds me in a family yeah. where one, the older child, was first, and the second child came, and they never worked or resolved the problem of sibling rivalry, and they grew to hate each other all their life. Mm -hmm. Why? Two people have to be willing in a forgiveness situation. And if one is stuck, how do you push it? If the other is willing to be pushed. <laughs> yeah, and if not, then what happens? It's not resolvable. Yeah, this, um, so how the burden is really on the one who's been rejected who's been treated poorly, to forgive and say, I'm moving on. Or they can get stuck in, and, and they're probably right. You know, the, the evidence is on their side. Everything indicates that this is true. They did treat it poorly. But they're not going to change what has to happen to the one who's been treated poorly to hopefully be able to forgive them and move on with his or her life, to begin to think about what if it hadn't been that way? What if they had treated me great? What would I have done? And so on. Um, my wife has been struggling with this one for a long time. She, um, her parents, her dad, psychiatrist, uh, and mom, very successful businesswoman, and they were very social and in Detroit area. And uh, when Detroit was <laughs> a good place to be social, not much in Detroit these days to be social about. Uh, but hopefully it's coming back with Ford and GM. But anyway, um, so their first child was a girl. On well, this family, it's very important to carry on the family name. Well, obviously, we have a girl. It's not going to carry on the family name. The second child was a girl. And that happened to be my wife. <laughs> Third child was... Jackpot, <laughs> Junior, and uh, named after his dad. And it was just 
obvious to me that my wife was just an inconvenience, an inconvenient child. If she hadn't come along, it would have been so much better. She just kind of took up our time and so on. We were, um, when my, we were first married, we were staying with her mother, my mother-in-law, in her flat in Sloan Square in London. And she would go out every day and she would come back with all kinds of presents for their son, nothing for my wife who was there. Every summer, the daughter, the oldest daughter, who um, married a guy from Germany who became a professor there, they would fly home to Detroit and she would pay all the costs. If we came to visit, we wouldn't pay a penny. <laughs> I mean, she was discriminated against. <laughs> Yeah, it's sh she, <laughs> okay. Well, oftentimes the middle child is also the one who can be the most sociable because they've learned how to relate to both sides. <laughs> well, I have an older sister uh -huh. who has always rejected me. I reach out to her on birthdays, on important occasions, mm -hmm. like she wasn't in the world. I never hear a word. And unfortunately, it filters down to her children as well. Although now, in later years, although I reach out to them and they are adults, they do respond, but not their mother. Mm -hmm. I think, in a sense, it, is, it has enhanced me as a human being mm -hmm. and broadened a lot of understanding and knowledge. But her and, and that's how you forgive. You, well, you live your own life and you recognize. But I would have liked to have had a sister. Yeah. Yeah who I biologically have. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it has to be two-sided. How many years apart are you? Three. Mm -hmm. Just about three. Yeah. So what, how is your wife dealing, how does your wife deal with this? <clears throat> um, the way she dealt with it was um, she became the, the rebel. The oldest daughter was a goody two-shoes and did good in school and got good grades and so on. And they pulled all kinds of strings to get the boy into medical school because he wasn't as smart as the two girls. And, and he <coughs> they got him in medical school and he became a doctor and so on. Um, but she became the rebel. She sort of ran away with a guy when she was 15 and you know for a few days and then came back. And then she got in college and. She decided she'd become a race car driver, and so she was driving race cars in college. And then she got very much into the women's movement and so on. Verified in their minds how exactly. she was. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if they're going to they think I'm bad, I'm going to prove them right. <laughs> but she uh, did it in a way that really enhanced her natural gifts. I mean, as a middle child, she gets along great with mechanics. She, <laughs> she, she traded, she changed her own motor and tires and everything as a race driver and puts it in. And she should have been an engineer. She should have been the boy, actually. Had she been the boy, they would have been so happy because she was so smart, so mechanical. She could be a great engineer. She's much better than I. She looks at something, immediately figures it out, and I uh, in, invariably <laughs> have to. You know, it's I have two grandchildren who unfortunately lost their father, our son, when they were about 7 and 11. And their mother really never remarried and was really not a great lover of men. She needed them to have two children, and she did. The older child, we were there when it happened, was so angered by the birth of the second child that she became hysterical, and her mother handled it. But she always brought them up saying to the second child, you're just like your father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now they're two adults, and the two girls really have each other. But the younger one has so many obvious problems, and the older one is trying to reach them, but she doesn't quite understand how. Finally, the second child, the younger child, went into analysis, and hopefully she will find her way. Mm. They're two very different people, but you know that 
original sibling rivalry and that you're just like your father. Right. You know? Sibling Roger just keeps on going through the years. Yeah. So has your wife forgiven her parents? <coughs> Doesn't sound like you it. You don't forgive, <laughs> you understand at the most. She, she certainly, certainly actually she, she didn't see it as clearly as I did. It's when we got together. Um, The reason I'm hesitating is because her parents both died relatively. Was she overwhelmed by guilt when they died? Well, I don't know. You know, her, her father was, um, as I say, a psychiatrist, but he was also a heavy smoker, and he died of emphysema, which is a horrible, horrible way to die. But he wasn't that old. And, and her mother d uh, went into dementia. She was younger than I am now. And uh, uh, so. I, I'm not quite sure. I know she, she. What, when I, when we, when the, I never did meet the dad because he died before we were married, um, <coughs> and um, when I married married her, she was trying, still trying very hard to get her mother's love. And I think that's, but I think she's begun to see her. We, we've had a lot of conversations because I've watched the interaction and, and, and she just somehow, she knew it but it hadn't really come into place. I said, you know, if your name had been Ted <coughs> instead of Susan, you would be in great shape. Because you could just see it, as I say, when we were on vacation and the different way in which, and the son was given all the uh, responsibility, he's going to be the executor and so on, and the two girls were much sharper than he, but he was the favorite. He was the one that they, the, the one they had been looking for, praying for, and uh, so that was it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we forgive because we know it's the right thing to do, to move forward. It's, it's also, also the healthiest, healthiest thing, thing for you to do. But that doesn't mean that it's received emotionally and spiritually and mindfully 100%. And forgiveness does not equal condone. You know, I forgive you for what you did. It doesn't mean I condone it. What it means is I'm not going to keep making you an excuse for why I'm not getting on with my life. I'm going to get on my, my life, and if you want to do it together with me, fine, but I'm not going to be stuck in this place of hurt and grief. I'm going to move on. And I think that's what it's really all about. And I ha to have a dream, uh, to have a desire, to have a goal, that's what's the important thing, and to try to, how can I do, what, could, what do I have to do to get that goal? This guy had the goal, he wanted to get, get his kids through college, and, and I think that's great, and I would really commend him for that, and say, you know, what you need to do is give yourself more credit for being such a good parent. Whether you're not, you stay together, that's another decision, but at least begin to recognize the ways in which you've kept this family going. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But is part of uh, forgiving also forgetting? I mean, if you've forgiven that person, are you released then? Of I, I think it is forgetting in the sense that I'm moving on and I'm uh, really putting myself in a new relationship or a new situation or a new place of living or, or a new social network or someone. Um, I could identify with this guy. I, I was divorced, and, uh, and, and I was sort of, sort of locked into this stupid idea that I could not live without this wonderful wife that I had, you know, because I just felt so fortunate and she was so wonderful and so on, without going into more details. But it, it took me a long time to realize, hey, I have a lot of things to be grateful for, and I can't for a while, I was be bemoaning the fact we were living in New Jersey, and I moved to San Francisco, and I became a single parent of two adolescent children. 
<laughs> I don't know if any of us are going to survive this, but we all did. And I was just recently thinking, I'm really going to send a letter to my two kids. Uh, again, I've told them this, but I think just put it in writing of how much they meant to me and how much I hope they'll forgive me for breaking up. Everybody thought we had the perfect marriage. I mean, my wife was extremely successful, superintendent of schools, became the secretary of education for the state, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, yeah, you just, I, I think you move on and say, this is not, I'm not going to stay stuck here. And if the other person moves along with you and it works out, hey, that's great. But if it doesn't, I'm not sacrificing myself anymore for this pain. And I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm going to be moving from being a victim to being more of a hero. Yeah. yeah. Has, anybody seen, has anybody else in here seen um, The Descendants? Yeah. yeah. Movie. Everything he's talking about, yes, that movie was, it's a movie called The Descendants. Oh, oh, yes. 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 Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. seen that. I've heard that. Oh, you've got to, everything right. you're, you're talking about relates yeah. to that movie. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, all the emotions going on. Uh -huh. and it's, yeah, the adolescent. Oh, that was all. The adolescent. Yeah, that. <laughs> he, he got stuck raising his girls too. Two dogs. Mm. Well, I had. Uh, I, 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 yeah. There's another movie uh, out called The Bell. I don't know if you can. Yeah, it just came out, hasn't it? Yeah. And uh, the parents of this daughter, or two daughters, the husband has an affair. And the daughter, one of the daughters, early on in the movie, cannot forgive him for that. And cannot understand why her mother can't forgive him. So she confronts her mother about, you know, why are you still with this man? And I may not have this exactly right, but her mother says to her, I remembered all the things that he did right in it. And I focused on those rather than the one thing that he did wrong. And I, and she basically said, I let it go. Okay. And and she also, about Hillary she also <laughs> recognized that yeah, she, it, she had an unenforceable rule. She could not change him. She could only, yeah. yeah. And that's what we have to recognize. Are we bucking up against an unenforceable rule? And at that point, say, hey, I've done my best, and I'm going to move on. I understand we're supposed to be out of the room in about five minutes. So um, let me just, I was hoping we'd have time to discuss this or you know, kind of break down into dyads or something. Thank you. Um, that's pretty easy. I just, a little exercise, and that is uh, imagine a past experience in your life when someone you cared for did something unfortunate and painful to you, and you did not ask for forgiveness. So it was very painful, and just too painful to ask for it. Now try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and try to imagine, and you can write these things down as you think, try to imagine one or two reasons why the person did not ask for your forgiveness. Now I think it's sometimes helpful to have an empathy for where the other person may be coming from. Other people on forgiveness feels it's not uh, so important. But I think it's important. If I know, for example, that I used to be a family therapist in New York, that um, I'm dealing with a family where the husband is very abusive, and then you find out, well, his father and mother were very abusive to him, and their father and mother, well, then you can at least not, you don't approve of the behavior, but it gives you a little understanding. And I think that's different than if somebody just goes off and starts beating somebody up for no reason whatsoever. So I think a little empathy is helpful. Now put yourself back into your own shoes and try to identify at least two things that kept you going in spite of the pain and hurt. And that's what I would say to this guy in Carolyn's thing. What kept you going? And, put you, and, and give yourself credit for what you've done. You kept the family together. You provided a good home for them. They got a good education. The boys have done well. And you even tried to take your wife to therapy. So, you know, you paid your dues. It's, it's time to move on. 
So I think if he could give himself a little more credit for what he had done and had accomplished, he might have been then more able to forgive and to move on. Sometimes we just don't give ourselves enough credit. So that's what I encourage you to do. And then congratulate yourself for being a survivor. And then think what kind of Valentine would you give yourself to celebrate? So happy Valentine's Day.